to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in first john 2 verse 25 the bible says this is the promise he has promised us eternal life we welcome you today to our study of the nature of god specifically today we're thinking about the god who fulfills his promises in the bible we are told that god cannot lie hebrews 6 verse 18 we're living in hope of eternal life which god who cannot lie promised before time began. Titus 1 verse 2, God does not change. Malachi 3 verse 6, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in view of that quality of God, we're going to be thinking about the God who cannot change and the promises that He has made to His children today. We're so glad that you joined us for our broadcast and we're looking forward to our study together in the Word of God today. We want to encourage you to locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to be looking in the Word of God to illustrate this quality of God from His Word and from His promises. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit them, uh, visit any of their assemblies. They'd be more than ha happy to have you as an honored guest. You'll find friendly, loving people there who are concerned about just going by the Bible and doing what God says. If you'd like to have a Bible study or you've got further questions about the Lord's Church or the plan of salvation or worship, well, they'd be more than happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. And friend, we want to encourage you here at the Gospel of Christ to visit our website where you can find just a large variety of Bible study resources. That website is thegospelofchrist.com. Everything we have on it is free and available to you free and for use in your study of the Word of God. We've got audio and video lessons, transcripts, and just a wide variety of good Bible study materials. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson today or any of our lessons, you can download those from our website in a digital download, or if you need it on a DVD or CD, Locate our free media request form from the website or call us or contact us. We'd be glad to get that to you in whatever format would help you in your journey to know God better and to ultimately make it to heaven. As we think today about the idea of the nature of God being the God who fulfills His promises, there's a lot of promises that are made in the Bible. There are approximately somewhere around 8,500 to 9,000 promises that are made in the Bible. The Old Testament contains somewhere around 75 to 7,700 of those. The New Testament has over 1,100 wonderful promises. In fact, you read chapters like Deuteronomy 28, and there are 133 promises in that chapter alone. One of the great things of the Bible is God promises over and over and over again wonderful things that you as a Christian, that I as a Christian can take and believe in every day. You know, Christians sing the song, Standing on the Promises. And what an encouraging idea that is that God has laid out this foundation of promises and we're standing in hope of that. But once it was said by Vance Hafner, and I think he's right about this, one, one, at one time he said, we're all too often sitting on the premises when in reality we ought to be standing on the promises of God. And that's so true. Christians have not been called to sit on the premises. We really have been called to stand on the promises. You know, this is not like men's promises that we're talking about. When we talk about the promises of God, we're not talking about sometimes how men make promises and don't fulfill them. Uh, let me illustrate. I heard this example one time that really illustrated this idea. The story was told about a man who 
uh, all his life, every time he got paid, he, he took $20 out of his paycheck and he put it under his mattress. Uh, eventually, that man got sick, and as he was about to die, his dying request to his wife is, he said, I want you to promise me one thing. Promise you what, she said. I want you to promise me that when I'm dead, you'll take all that money I've been saving from under the mattress, put it in my casket so that I can take it all with me when I go. Well, he died, and his wife kept her promise. She uh, went in, got all the money that day that, uh, that he collected up, and that day that he died, and she went to the bank and deposited it, wrote it in a check, and put it in the casket with him. Well, you can see that that didn't do a whole lot of good. She kind of fulfilled what she said her promise was, but it didn't do that man much good. But well, men are not like God is. God makes promises, and those promises that he makes, you can rest assured, you can have confidence in that when God promises something, well, friend, that's the way it's going to be. And it's that way because God's nature demands it. Let me remind you of this again. Hebrews 6 verse 18 says this, It is impossible with God who cannot lie. God, it's impossible for God to lie. There are certain things that when you think about God, just can't go with that. And when you think about God, it's impossible for God to be God and lie. Those two are incompatible. And so God is always truthful, is always right, and His promises will always come true. Titus 1 verse 2 says we're living in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie. Not only is it impossible, but God can't lie. It's against His very nature, and thus he, He's not going to change. Malachi 3, 6, uh, He's the same yesterday, past, today, present, and future. And so as you think about God's promises, His character demands that those promises are always going to come true. Now, let's, let's kind of think about some of those promises. Let, let's think about the magnificence of the promises of God and the assurance we have because of those promises. What are some of God's promises that mean so much to the Christian that they really can stand on those promises? Number one, one of the great promises of God who always fulfills His promise is this. When God says... You've been forgiven. Well, friend, you can take it to the bank. You've been forgiven. And when God tells someone, as in Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and someone does that, every sin has been forgiven. Uh, like Saul of Tarsus in Acts 22, 16, when Saul was told, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Well, friend, you can be sure. Every sin was washed away. When the Bible says in Hebrews 8 verse 12, God says, I'll be merciful to their sins, their lawless deeds I'll remember no more, you can rest assured. God's not going to remember that anymore. God says, I'll cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7 verses 18 and 19. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Friend, as it relates to the idea of forgiveness, when God says... You're forgiven. You're forgiven. That sin is no longer going to be held against you. Now, men aren't always like that. Sometimes we forgive people, but we bring it back up. Or we want to dig up the past, as it were. That's not God. When God says, I'll remember it no more. How wonderful it is to know. Whether it be a lie I've told, whether it be something immoral that someone's done, whether it be an attitude that was wrong, whether it be an action that I was... Whatever it may be, when God tells us that our sins have been washed away, when God tells us that our sins are remitted by the blood of Jesus, I don't have to worry about those anymore. That doesn't mean that I don't know that I committed them. That doesn't mean that uh, there isn't sometimes a, a dread or a guilt that I did that, but it's not going to haunt me anymore spiritually. It means this. When I stand before the throne of God on that great and final day when men are judged according to the words of Jesus, John 12, 48, if I've obeyed the gospel, what I did on October, October the 6th, 1982, it's not on that page anymore. Whatever sin I might have committed, if I have obeyed the gospel, that sin is covered by the blood of Jesus and it will not be held against me. 
God, when God promises to forgive, God completely forgets. He no longer holds that against us. Let's talk then about a, a second promise that Christians really can stand upon. We stand on, on God's forgiveness and how wonderful that is. But we also stand on the promise of heaven. Don't you want to go to heaven? More than anything in all the world, don't you want to go to heaven? I want to be in that place Jesus spoke about one day. Uh, John 14, verse 1, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. If, if your heart's desire is to go to heaven, to, to live with God, well, friend, you can be sure there is a place called heaven and all of God's faithful children will go there. And the Bible says it is a place where there be no more sin, sorrow, death, crying, pain, all the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. We'll be in the presence of Almighty God, according to Revelation 21 and chapter 22. Uh, it'll be a place where the saints of old are. It'll be a place where loved ones who've gone on before us are. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses uh, 13 through 18. It'll be a place of wonder and bliss. And friend, here's the good news. Jesus Christ and God, who are the same yesterday, today, and future forever, you can rest assured that what you read about in the Bible about heaven, that's something you can stand on. You can stand on that promise. It, when the Bible says, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life, friend, you can be sure there is a crown. When the Bible says in 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5, that we have a, a place reserved, we have a reservation in heaven, as it were, when you get to heaven, your name's going to be there if you've lived faithful. The, you know, if you're a Christian, and the res it's not going to be as though, I'm sorry, your name's no. God's promises of heaven will always be an encouragement that every Christian can fall back on. Thirdly, as you think about some of the great promises of God. One of those that the Christian stands upon, standing on the promises, one of those that we stand on as it relates to God's unwavering nature is this. Christians have the promise that we can communicate with God through prayer. We stand on the promise that God hears, that God cares, and that God answers our prayers. Listen to Hebrews 4 verse 16. The Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Well, Christians have the power and the ability through their prayers, as it were, to go to the very throne room of God where we can find help in time of need. What an encouragement that is. This is why we're told, pray without ceasing. This is why the Bible tells us of the, the power of prayer, the effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. And friend, as a child of God, when we face difficulty, when we face challenges, when we face things that we're just not sure how it's going to all work out, here's what we have the confidence in. The Bible says this, Cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. Friend, is it encouraging to know God cares for me and you. You know, we think about God on the bigger level, but I want you to think about God on an individual level. God cares for you. And God says, you cast all your cares upon me, I care for you. God knows, God cares, and through the avenue of prayer, we have the, 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 the privilege and the power of taking our very needs, our praise, our thanksgiving to God, and what a wonderful blessing that is. And so we stand on that promise. God knows, God cares, and God hears the Christian's prayer. Another great promise that Christians are standing upon every day is the promise of victory in Christ Jesus. If, as we've seen in the Bible, we know that God is true, God is going to win has already won the war, he's going to win in the end, and Christians will be victorious with him ultimately one day. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. The Bible says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we, if we, as the picture describes, run that race with endurance, 2 Timothy chapter 2, if we're faithful to the end, Revelation 2 verse 10, then friend, we're going to hear that this is not just something Christians repeat because it sounds good. If we're faithful to the end, the Bible says is this is what we'll hear in Matthew 25. Isn't this encouraging? Well done to those who have lived faithful, done right, tried to live according to the Bible, been washed in the blood of Jesus. The Bible says the victory line that we'll hear is this. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. I know sometimes it seems like Satan is winning, as it were. I know sometimes it seems like Sin is so rampant that it's almost as though everyone's given to it. But friend, the battle's already been won. Hebrews 2.14 says, Jesus through death overcame him who had the power of death and has released those who all their lifetime were subject to uh, bondage. Jesus has already defeated Satan at the cross. Hebrews 2 verse 14. And the good news is, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, verse 4, and if, although he's like that raging, roaring lion, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, one day the key of the bottomless pit is going to be opened up and he and his angels are going to be cast in that and God will ultimately and finally be victorious and Christians with him. And so what are we standing on? We're standing on the fact that we're on the winning side that God's going to be victorious and that ultimately we'll have that as part of the Christian hope. Here's another promise that we're standing upon. Christians are also standing in great confidence and hope upon the resurrection, the promise of the resurrection. I want to read a couple of passages with you that illustrate this idea and the promise that we have. Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 11 verse 24 and 25. Jesus speaks to Mary and Martha about their brother Lazarus and in John 11 verse 25 Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And then Jesus goes on to say, Whoever lives and believes in me, or whoever lives and believes in me, shall never die. And he goes on to say, Do you believe this? And so when you think about promises that, that Christians have, friend, we're standing on the fact that although this old body is going to return to the dust, according to the book of Ecclesiastes, we're also standing on the fact that all are in the grave will one day come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The grave is not the end. Unlike Rover, when we die, we're not dead all over. Christians do have the hope and promise of the resurrection. Listen to that second passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 13. Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Paul says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Here's the, the comfort and the encouragement. All Christians are one day going to rise and be with God. If we live faithful, if our loved ones live faithful, nobody's going to be left out. Every faithful child of God is one day going to be resurrected to live with God forever. Friend, you know what else that teaches me? There's so much more than just this temporal, tangible now. Right here and now is only the temporary side. We're looking forward to something far greater. If one day our bodies are going to be raised incorruptible, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 following, I need to put my hope, my mindset, and my aim and effort on that great day that we can be with God for all eternity. Thank God that the grave is not the end of man. That there's so much more and we're standing on that promise of the resurrection. 
Friend, another great promise that we have in Christ is the promise of God's grace toward mankind. The grace of God, how wonderful, how amazing it is. The grace of God that brings salvation, it's appeared to all men in Jesus Christ. Titus 2 verses 11 through 13. It is that grace that saves. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. We, we live by that grace of God every day and that grace has been made available in Jesus Christ for all the world to be saved. And when God promises His grace that uh, we can receive that grace, that we can be obedient to His gospel, and that by grace through faith we can be saved, a friend, that's something we can stand upon. You know, grace, someone's rightly defined grace in this way. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is God's offer of salvation to all who will accept and obey Him. And friend, we're standing on the fact that God is a gracious, merciful, loving God who has made that salvation available and anyone, anywhere, can take part in that. You know, as we think about things that Christians are standing on, the promises of God, let's also realize that we're standing on the promise of God's providence and God's care for His people. I want to read to you a very beautiful passage about this in Psalm chapter 37. If you got your Bible, I'd like for you to look along. This is such a beautiful passage that Christians stand upon every day. Look at Psalm 37. And I want you to listen to this passage about God's care and providing for His people. David said this in Psalm 37, verse 25. David said, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. David kind of looks back on life. And as he looks at life from when he was young to the point now that he's old, he says, I've been young and now I'm old. And I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. What does that passage teach us? God does care, and God does know, and He will meet our needs. Uh, in Matthew 6, Jesus really illustrated this in a vivid way. And you may be familiar with Matthew 6, verse 33, but I want to read to you the context of that, which really illustrates this idea so beautifully. Uh, listen to Matthew 6, verse 28. Jesus said, Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Now listen, your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Paul said it this way in Philippians 4.19, My God will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. What's great about the promises of God? Friend, if I put, if I put first... God's kingdom. If I try to walk in the light, if I'm a child of God and I'm trying to live faithful to the Lord, well, you can rest assured. You can stand on this promise. God's going to help you in that. God's going to take care of you. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God takes care of his own. Jesus said, why do you worry about food and clothing and shelter? Let the Gentiles worry about all that. You put first God's kingdom. God's going to do His part. And then we mention a final promise that is so wonderful and so amazing. Christians are standing on this. We have the promise of eternal life. The Bible says in 1 John 2 verse 25, writing to Christians, John says in 1 John 2 verse 25, this is the promise He's promised us, eternal life. Now friend, the idea of eternal life is, is not so much with the longevity of it, but it's the, 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 the quality as well. We're not saying eternal life isn't forever. That, that's not the idea we're saying, but there's more to it than just the longevity. Let me illustrate. In John 17, 3, Jesus said this, This is eternal life, that they may know you, 
the true and living God. What is eternal life really? Is it the longevity? Well, that idea would be a part of it, but there's more to it than that. Eternal life is being with God forever. Friend, can you imagine that idea? One of the things that we stand upon every day is that by God's grace, through the blood of Jesus, we can one day be with God forever. Can you imagine that? The God of light, the God of love, the God who made the greatest sacrifice, the God who takes care of His own, the God who cannot lie, will not cheat, does not change. One day, you can live with God forever. Isn't that something to really stand upon? So you say, okay, these promises are wonderful. That's amazing. I can really stand on that. That's something of a, a sure foundation that we can really build upon. Friend, for these promises to be yours, you've got to be a child of God. God makes these promises available to every child of His. And so the question begs, are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you submitted your will to the will of the Master. In Acts 18.8, 18, the Bible says that the Corinthians, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. Have you heard the Word of God? Romans 10 verse 17. Do you believe Jesus is the Savior of the world? John 8 verse 24. Would you turn from sin and turn to God? Acts 3 verse 19. Would you acknowledge with your mouth Jesus is the Savior of the world? Romans 10 verse 10. And friend, to have every sin washed away, would you be immersed in water? Acts 2 verse 38, Peter clearly preached, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Acts 22 16, Saul was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And Jesus said it so clearly, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Friend, God wants you in His kingdom. Jesus died so that you could have the hope of salvation. These promises that we've talked about today that are the, the sure foundation that every Christian stands upon, those can be yours. And God wants those to be yours. But you've got to be a child of God. If you've never done that, we're begging you today to become a Christian. Nobody would want to miss out on these promises. We love you. God loves you. Won't you stand on these promises? by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.